This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. It's my music. Break it down. It's the king. Oh, you didn't know? Stand back. I'm a Mamacita. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? Eat me. You're listening to Music of the Mat on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 97, and today I'll talk to you guys a little bit about the latest release of WWE Uncaged 14. Hope you all had a nice Thanksgiving, uh, given the circumstances. A bit different this year, I think. Um, I know mine was, because I was working. And normally where I work at the radio station, they cater Thanksgiving for the people who have to work that day. Well... This year, uh, we didn't get any of that stuff. We didn't get any turkey or mashed potatoes or gravy or or vegetables because of the pandemic, which makes sense, I guess, sure. But that means that instead of having turkey and mashed potatoes and gravy and vegetables, my Thanksgiving dinner this year was a tuna fish sandwich on an egg bagel. That was my Thanksgiving feast for this lovely year. And you know what? Honestly, I was a bit down about all that stuff because, you know, it's Thanksgiving. You want to have traditional Thanksgiving food on Thanksgiving. That was until I listened to the fantastic Shake Them Ropes podcast, also part of the VOW Podcast Network, and I heard the delightful, the wonderful Jeff Hawkins, former guest of this show, he revealed that he had himself some hot dogs for Thanksgiving this year. So you know what? For cheering me up about a depressing Thanksgiving meal, I'm sending a virtual fist bump Jeff Hawkins' way. So thank you, Jeff, for that. We have this bond now, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Also, in much more positive news, uh, this episode is coming out on December 1st, which is the day before my birthday. December 2nd. That's my birthday. Uh, Also the birthday of Britney Spears. Lucy Liu, Nelly Furtado, Aaron Rodgers, Jinsei Shinzaki, a.k.a. Hakushi. And uh, as well, it's the birthday of a fellow VOW contributor, Mr. Steve Case. So a happy birthday to Steve as well. I don't know how old he's going to be. I'll be 28, which is just, it's crazy. You know, it's, it's the old cliche. I know, I know. But it does feel like yesterday, right? That I was 10 years old. Watching wrestling during my my early fandom days, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, full of hope and wonder. Just a a real sweet kid who watched Eddie Guerrero spray the big show with his own diarrhea shit on SmackDown. You know, that old cliche. And uh, yeah, now it's, what, 17 years later and (laughs) somehow I'm still a wrestling fan, despite its best efforts. It tries to get rid of me. Oh, it certainly tries, but... uh, you know what? Hey, I'm still here. I'm still a fan, and I'm looking forward to many more years of of both good and bad wrestling to come. <laughs> All right, let's get to the matter at hand here. Uh, today we will look at WWE Uncaged 14, the mammoth new album with over 50 tracks on it. That's right, 50 plus. Not just WWE's main audience these days. It's also the size of their track listings. Now, I'm not going to go over all 53 tracks on this album one by one. That would just be insane and take about, uh, I guess, seven hours or so. Instead, I'm just going to do a little overview of the album. Give my thoughts on it as a whole, play a few tracks, and say a few words about the Uncaged series in general as well. Because, you know, in the past, when I've introed a song, I'll say something like, This song can be found on WWE Uncaged 2 or three, or whatever. But I've never talked about what the Uncaged albums actually are, which are collections of unreleased Jim Johnston tracks that are finally seeing the light of day. 
Because the thing about Jim Johnston is that, you know, for about 30 years, he dedicated his whole life to making music for WWE. Not just the entrance themes, of course, but also TV themes and pay-per-view themes, music for video packages, film soundtracks. The guy was just an absolute machine who cranked out just so much music over the years. But for a long time, a large portion of that music didn't actually get official releases. You had the albums like WWE The Music Volumes 1 through 10 and the Anthology album, and then when it got to the 2010s, he began releasing music as singles instead of albums. But even then, with all that stuff out there, there was still a lot of music that was kept, metaphorically speaking, in the vault. It's kind of like Prince. Prince put out a ton of albums during his lifetime, hundreds of songs. But you look online, and there's still just a giant list of songs that are unreleased. Now, this is where the Uncaged albums come in, because towards the end of Jim Johnston's tenure in WWE, 2016, they put out the first Uncaged album, and it had a bunch of themes that had never been released before. You had themes for Scott Steiner, The Boogeyman, Alundra Blaze, Iron Sheik, Tajiri, Dan Severn, Eddie Guerrero, as featured in the previous episode, and so on. And then, a few months later, we got Uncaged 2, and then Uncaged 3, and then Uncaged 4, and 5, and 6, and so on and so on, until the most recent one we have now, which is Uncaged 14. Which really just reinforces the notion that Jim Johnston was such a workhorse, because We've got 14 albums of unreleased music, including an album that has over 50 tracks on it. It's pretty incredible. Now, most of the Uncaged albums are just a random collection of songs from various eras and types of wrestlers, but there are a few with a set theme. Uncaged 6 is composed entirely of women's themes. Molly Holly, Ivory, Beth Phoenix, Victoria, Candice Michelle... Katie Lee Burchell, although I guess technically one of the songs does belong to a guy because the track Party On is attributed to Alicia Fox and DJ Gabriel. I know I mentioned Prince earlier in comparison to Jim Johnston, but uh, I think with that song, Jimmy was really leaning into that comparison because that was a nice little uh, homage, shall we say, to Party Man from the Batman soundtrack. Now, Uncaged 9 also has its own motif because it's made up of TV and pay-per-view themes. WrestleMania 15, Super Astros, WWE Confidential, Livewire, the I Like It Raw theme from 95... It also has the theme from The Great American Bash 2004, and that song sounds very similar to another theme. Did you figure it out? That song is an early version of Mr. Kennedy's theme, Turn Up the Trouble. Kennedy! Oh, no. 
Obviously, he changed up the lyrics a little bit and reworked some of the music, but that's where the Mr. Kennedy theme came from. And that's a cool feature of these albums. It's hearing the progression of themes from version to version and hearing the changes that Jim Johnston made with each one. What Uncaged 9 also has is the iconic cage-lowering music. And if you're wondering if the cage lowering music has its own title other than cage lowering music, it does. It's called Imminent Danger. A very appropriate title, I think. But besides those two albums, the other uncaged albums, like I said, are just a, a mishmash of various songs, including Uncaged 14, which we'll get to now. There are 53 tracks on this album, which is the most of any uncaged album so far. It also has the longest runtime of any of these albums at 2 hours and 38 minutes, which is the same runtime as There Will Be Blood. So if you want to kill 158 minutes, you can either listen to this album or watch Daniel Day-Lewis bash Paul Dano's brains in with a bowling pin. It's your choice, but remember, There Will Be Blood does not have Lord Tensai's theme in it. The album cover for all the Uncaged albums is the same. It's a picture of the Hell in a Cell cage hanging over the ring at a show, except each album has its own distinct color tint to it. There's red, there's purple, gold, orange, pink, light blue, dark blue. 14's color? A nice lovely turquoise. Which is fitting because it's now December, and the birthstone for December is... Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Turquoise. There you go. Okay, so how do we break this album down? Well, the way I want to do it is to break these songs into various categories. There's the most basic category, which is singular themes that are just one and done. Meaning that the wrestler only used this specific theme and no other versions or remixes of that song. For example, the Kenzo Suzuki theme, War Robe. Kenzo Suzuki, the evil Japanese man who dressed in traditional Japanese garb, his valet and wife Hiroko dressed like a geisha, he hates America, boo! Naturally, he's going to come out to some sinister traditional East Asian music, with the flutes and the strings and the big pounding drums that just overpower the song. Well, this is the only theme that Kenzo Suzuki had when he was in WWE. There are no other remixes or second versions or third versions. Yeah, he had a combo theme of sorts when he was in a tag team with Rene Dupree, but as far as singles themes go, he just had this. Same goes for another song on this album called Bowleg Cowboy.
that is the theme for Freddie Joe Floyd, a.k.a. the late, great Tracy Smothers. Tracy died not too long ago, and uh, I know he didn't do much as Freddie Joe Floyd, but I figured I'd pay a little tribute to him by playing some of his theme song here. And you know what? It's a fun little banjo ditty, ain't it? It certainly fits him, that's for sure, because whether he was called Freddie Joe Floyd or not, Tracy was a good old southern boy, in real life and in gimmick. He isn't getting some just generic rock song, no, no. He's getting some nice country bumpkin banjo music. And I should point out the title as well, Bowleg Cowboy. Where was Freddie Joe Floyd built from? Bowlegs, Oklahoma. Which not only is a real place, but it's where the Briscoe brothers came from, Jack and Gerald. And do you know where the name Freddie Joe Floyd came from? Jack's real name is Freddie Joe, and Gerald's real name is Gerald Floyd. Freddie Joe Floyd from Bowlegs, Oklahoma. Complete with an entrance theme whose main instrument is best known for being in the movie Deliverance. So a little fun at the behest of Jack and Jerry, I suppose, but uh, hey, regardless of all that, a big rest in peace to Tracy Smothers. I'm sure right now he's up there in heaven, cutting a promo on all the angels. The next person I hear chanting Tracy sucks, everybody dies. But Tracy, we're already dead. I don't care, I'll bring you back to life and kill you again. What we're talking about here is we're talking about Bloody yeah, Sunday. Uh, we're talking about yeah, the night. Baby. And we're talking about the thug. T is for terrible. H is for hell. U is for ugly. And G is for jail. Cause a thug can't spell. The second category is one I touched on earlier with the Great American Bash theme. It's early versions of theme songs that aren't as well known as their more iconic counterparts because they weren't used very long, but they're still very important because they give you a view into Jim Johnston's mindset and his process and the way he pictured the songs in his head to start off with, and perhaps it makes you appreciate the little changes that he did make to these songs to make them stand out more. Remember The Union, the stable that formed briefly in 1999 to combat the corporate ministry? It had Mankind, Big Show, Ken Shamrock, and Test. The full name of the group was the Union of People You Oughta Respect, Son, or Up Yours for short. <sighs> Thank you, Vince Russo. Well, the Union had its own theme song called Unionized. <laughs> I'm not saying it's a great theme or even a good one, but I want you to keep in mind the opening of that song with the steam whistle and the group vocal, Union. Keep that in mind and let me play the first version of the Union theme called Up Yours. We are the Union! Same melody, maybe a different sound overall, but you can definitely tell that it's the same song, pretty much. But notice the different intro. No steam whistle here. Instead, it's We Are The Union. dun da 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 Union. I get the idea behind it, the group vocal, we're a united force, but doesn't it feel like a half-hearted retread of the intro to the Nation of Domination theme? Same intent, same group vocal, same format even. We are the group name. Beat. Group name. But it doesn't have the same oomph as the nation theme does, does it? It doesn't feel as impactful. It feels like a cheap copy. 
which is why I think it was a smart choice on Jim Johnston's part to do away with we are the union and go with the steam whistle because a steam whistle makes you think of factories, the workforce, iron workers, union number 58 or whatever. So not only does it work as a stinger, but it's a more unique touch to signify unity than just saying we are the union. Here's another example of an early version of a theme song that would get changed for the better. And all I have to say is just one word. Heidenreich. Maybe you recall Heidenreich reciting his poems that he called disaster pieces. Maybe you recall Heidenreich as a member of the Legion of Doom with Road Warrior Animal. Or maybe you recall Heidenreich kidnapping Michael Cole one time and sexually assaulting him in the bathroom. Oh, the fun we had with our pal John Heidenreich, including his theme song called Dangerous Politics. Heiden Heidenreich. Heiden Reich. Heidenreich, a big scary man, his theme song sounding like a marching force coming towards you with menace, the pounding boom of the percussion. You've heard that motif before in Goldberg's theme or Ryback's theme. But for me, what puts it over the top are the vocals done by Paul Heyman, who was his manager for a spell. Heiden, Heidenreich, Heidenreich. A, it undoubtedly cements itself as a Heidenreich theme, because... Lord knows, no one else will come out to a song with the lyrics Heidenreich in it. And B, it's just so ridiculous, isn't it? Just the mental image of Paul Heyman in a studio recording Heiden, Heidenreich, Heidenreich. But hey, it works. Not just because it's Paul Heyman hyping up a client, but also because, let's be honest, Heidenreich was a goddamn nutso. <laughs> he was off his rocker. So the idea of him having this theme song that just repeats his name over and over again like a psychotic mantra, that all makes sense. Now, on Uncaged 14, there's an early version of this song called Controlled Politics. It's literally the same song, just without the vocals. And yeah, the music still works fine, but it doesn't feel complete like the Dangerous Politics theme does. It needs those vocals to be the cherry on top of this wacky Sunday. We talk about various versions of themes being on these uncaged albums. I think it's a good time to point out that not every single one of these tracks belongs to a different wrestler. No, no, no. Some wrestlers get multiple tracks on this album. The Legion of Doom get two tracks. Sylvester Turkai gets two tracks. Sylvain Granier gets two tracks. How about The Rock? He gets two tracks on the album as well. But wait, there's more. Stone Cold Steve Austin gets three tracks on this album, all of them from his Alliance heel run. William Regal also gets three tracks on this album. But the man who comes in first place with the most tracks on WWE Uncaged 14, is none other than old Booger Red himself, The Undertaker. Undertaker gets a whopping four tracks on this album. No one or two or three, but four! But what the hell am I supposed to do with an empty case? Sorry, fifth element. Couldn't help but slip that in. 
Another facet of the album, and this one has to do with song titles. Because sometimes on these albums, they'll feature a version of a theme song and call it a remix. Or they'll differentiate it by the year it came out. But in a lot of cases, they'll just give the song a completely different title. On the last episode about Eddie Guerrero, we played his Viva La Raza theme. Then we played the heel remix of that song. But on Uncaged 2, they don't call it Viva La Raza heel remix. They give it a new title, Lie, Cheat, Steal. Despite it being just a slight variation of the same song. Same on this album. Undertaker has four songs, three of which are variations of the Ministry of Darkness theme, but they don't call the songs Ministry Version 4 or Ministry Super Evil Remix. Instead, the songs are called Buried Souls, Plague of Evil, and Lord of Darkness. Which, to be fair, to be fair, it's a little bit easier to catalog and reference these themes with those titles as opposed to, say, remembering which one is version 1, 2, 3, and so on. So, I get the mindset there. Where things get tricky, though, is when those songs are mislabeled on the album, which is what happens on Uncaged 14. I brought up Sylvain Granier's two tracks. When La Resistance split up in 05, Sylvain Granier went to SmackDown and became Sylvain. And he had this supermodel gimmick. And his entrance theme was this techno music. Not crazy rave techno music, but the kind of techno you hear on a fashion show as they're walking down the runway. Very trendy, very chic, trying to be cool but not wild. The first version of that theme is called Supermodel. The second version of that theme, which he used for longer, is called World is Sylvan. As you can see, just like with the Heidenreich themes, they're the same song, it's just that the World is Sylvan song has the vocals, the world is Sylvan. But, for some reason, on Uncaged 14, the titles are swapped on those two tracks. When you play Supermodel, you hear World is Sylvan. And when you play World is Sylvan, you hear Supermodel. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out how that mistake was made. Why would a song called World is Sylvan not have the world is Sylvan in it? And why would a song not called World is Sylvan have the world is Sylvan in it? Does it matter in the long run? Not really, but damn it, it's the principle of it all. And it flares up my OCD, so please get the song titles right, I beg of you. Anyway, moving on to a new category here, and this is really simple. It's just themes you may have forgotten even existed. Not like earlier, where it's a slight variation of a well-known theme. I mean a theme that was unique in itself, but completely overshadowed by other themes a wrestler had and got lost to time. The full-blooded Italians in WWE. Nunzio, Chuck Palumbo, Johnny the Bull Stamboli. You ask someone like me, who grew up watching that era of WWE, hey, what was the FBI theme? And I guarantee you, they will say...
the No Sleep Till Brooklyn ripoff called, appropriately, Brooklyn. Because they're Italians from New York, forget about it. And on Uncaged 14, there's a track called Full-Blooded Italian. But you press play, and you'll hear something very different than that Brooklyn theme. That is the first FBI theme. Doesn't really fit the whole Italian-American gangster, oh, let's rob this guy and go eat some gabagool motif, does it? Feels a little circuit puzzle in a video game. A little too high-tech with the electronica. It doesn't have the menace or the edge that an FBI theme needs, especially in WWE, because ECW FBI had that wink and smile and nudge nudge but WWE FBI was a lot more serious and harder edged, so a song like this doesn't really stick with them, and historically, it hasn't stuck either. Even though they had this song for like a few months, not just one or two shows, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who remembers them having this theme. Here's another forgotten theme that especially surprised me, because I was watching at the time. It's also mistitled, and it belongs to William Regal. On the album, it's called On the Courtyard. But my sources tell me the song is actually called What You Gonna Do Now. Yes, that is a William Regal theme. Now, when I heard it, my first assumption was, oh, this is probably an early Stephen Regal, real man's man theme that was used once or twice in 98. Because it is this generic southern rock instrumental, something that a real man's man might use as a theme song. But then I checked the footage. He had this sucker in 04 and 05. 04 and 05! And that was prime... Andrew watches every single WWE show territory. I remember quite a lot about that era, but I did not remember this song at all. This was when William Regal was looking after Eugene on Eric Bischoff's behalf, and then Triple H and Evolution beat up Eugene, so William Regal, who had grown quite fond of the young man, was like, I'm gonna get you for that sunshine! So it became Regal's face theme, and he had it for a while too, he had it for like a year. And then he turned heel and went back to his old theme, of course, but I just completely blanked on this one. No recollection of it at all. Here's one that might shock you into a coma, so brace yourself. The Rock. He's got a billion theme songs, right? And since he became The Rock, those theme songs all feature the same melody. Down, 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 down. Uncaged 14. Track 52, People's Champion. You smell what The Rock is cooking? Ha! <laughs> the Rock's laying the smackdown. The Rock says... The Rock says... The Rock says, The Rock, The Rock, The Rock says, Rock had this theme for one episode of Monday Night Raw, 
October 19th, 1998. This was during the time period when Rock was a face after he left the nation, but before he turned heel again and joined the corporation at Survivor Series 98. And I just have to say, thank God this was only used for one night because I have no idea what Jim Johnston was thinking with this one. This is not a rock theme. I don't care how many The Rock says vocal drops you put in it. This does not work. The Rock is so tied to his melody and it fits his aura and his swagger so well that replacing it with this kind of standard synth beat it's just all wrong. In fact, it's not just wrong, it's unoriginal. Because on Uncaged 14, the same album, there's a track called Chicago Warriors, which was briefly used by LOD2000 earlier in 98. And it has the same synth beat as the one in this song. So luckily, People's Champion was put away on the shelf and forgotten about and never used again as a rock theme because it just does not work. You smell what the rock is cooking? One more song I want to play here, and it's another one from my youth. Maybe you remember the odd couple tag team of Rico and Charlie Haas with Miss Jackie as their valet. I know I do. Well, their theme song is called Fashion Icons. Take a listen to this bad boy. You, you look so good to me Baby, you know, of all the wrestlers to have a theme song that absolutely shreds, Rico would not be high on the list of obvious candidates. But goddamn, this song shreds from start to finish. And I'm someone who's a fan of the regular version of this theme, You Look So Good To Me. I enjoy that song, whether it's Rico, Billy and Chuck, what have you, because I just love those harmonies. So this one, it's like the best of both worlds. You get the harmonies with the vocals, and you also get this great guitar work from Jimmy Bell, which works for the tag team as well, because you had the colorful, flamboyant Rico, and you had the more serious, grounded Charlie Haas. It doesn't seem like that pairing would work, but it does, just like this song. And Jimmy Bell, he's a guitarist who has worked on countless theme songs with Jim Johnston over the years. He did themes for Bret Hart, The Hart Dynasty, Paul London, The Miz... Eminem, Baron Corbin, The Teacher's Pets, Chuck Palumbo, John Morrison, Edge, Eugene, Bobby Lashley, Snitsky, The Dude Busters, a whole cavalcade of theme songs, with fashion icons being one of them. And this one gets the Andrew seal of approval 100%. So yeah, that's WWE Uncaged 14 in a nutshell. Obviously, there are many more tracks that I didn't even mention. I mean, we got everyone from Tommy Dreamer and Shannon Moore to Luther Reigns and Tatanka, Bob Sparkplug Holly, Meal Mascaris, Tiger Ali Singh, Bill Damott, Triple H's Armageddon 2000 theme. There is just so much to listen to on this album. And I gotta say, it's been a real pleasure to have not just Uncaged 14, but all the Uncaged albums come out. Because I'm someone who's not just a fan of wrestling music or enjoys the nostalgia of it all. But as someone who does a wrestling music podcast, 
You know me. I've said this before. I prefer to use music that is of a good studio quality. I'm not a big fan of using show recordings or things like that. So to have all of these unreleased themes come out in a good studio quality, it's been a real godsend. And I don't know how many tracks are left in the Jim Johnston vault. Maybe it's like the end of Raiders where it just goes on forever. But as long as these uncaged albums keep coming out, I'll be a happy boy. And that's going to do it for this episode of Music of the Mat. Thank you so much for listening. Music of the Mat is, of course, part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. You can find all the great podcasts on there at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Mat. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. You can discuss this episode or other topics at the VOW Discord. That's VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord. If you want to donate to the show, you can do that. Just go to VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Donate and click the big Donate button beneath the name Music of the Mat. And of course, rate, review, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. I'm Andrew Rich, and I'll see you next time on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys. Music of the Mat is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders.